So good afternoon, everybody. Um, once again, I'm John Matthewson, the curator here at the Dorset Historical Society. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming into this wonderful air-conditioned place um, during the hot and humid weather. Um, today, we have our speaker, Dr. Robert Treat, and um, I would tell you all about him, but he's going to do that. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to have spoilers for your talk. Well, I think it's better if I do it than you do it. <laughs> I'm not sure what you might say. Oh! <laughs> Only good things, I'm sure. But I want to take this quick opportunity to say that um, um, our next speaker in August, third Thursday in August, um, will be Julia Casey. She's coming over from the Clifton Park, Boston Spa area. She's been doing a lot of deep research into the history of um, some counterfeiters. The Crane family, ring of counterfeiters, who operated all over um, the United States in the 1790s. Um, but their um, headquarters were in Rupert. So I'm really looking forward to this. Um, but anyway, I'm also looking forward to hearing um, Dr. Treat right now. So please. Well, thank you. Um, Probably just to start out with the idea of uh, how our family got here. Uh, uh, my father grew up on a small farm in, uh, in the mountains in Massachusetts. Uh, they had about 15 head of cattle and they did everything with horses. Uh, the veterinarian that took care of their animals uh, got my father interested in veterinary medicine and, and made him decide to go out. To, well, at that point, uh, there, there were just two or three veterinary hospitals. This was back, this would have been back in 19, he graduated in high school in 27. So then he, he went out to Columbus, Ohio, to the veterinary school out there <laughs> Uh, and he he rode a motorcycle out and back for, for four years. <laughs> so uh, he he uh, graduated uh, in in around nineteen uh, I guess it'd be about nineteen thirty two, and it was in the height of the depression, and there were no no. No, no work to be done. I mean, some people maybe, but very little money. And people weren't paying for having their animals looked at. They just had to let them go. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that point, the federal government had started a, a program to eradicate tuberculosis and brucellosis. Uh, are you folks familiar with, with any of those? Well, well, certainly TB, you were. And and back then, you remember, well, I remember as a youngster, I'm sure many of you do, driving over through New York State. In upper New York State, there were several, I think they call them sanitariums, right. where people were sent with TB, TB to recover. Uh, the fresh air and all was supposed to help them to recover. I, I'm not sure how, how effective all that was. I guess uh, it probably was reasonably effective, but a lot of, a lot of people <laughs> went there. And uh, the other thing that wasn't well known at that point uh, in the general public was brucellosis, or in humans it was called undulant fever. And uh, almost all the animals it, 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 almost all the herds would have at least one or more animals that were sick. So the federal government, because it was infecting people, wanted to wanted to wipe it out. So they, they hired all these veterinarians to start TB and blood testing uh, all the uh, cows. All the bovine animals from six months of age or older had to be TB tested and blood tested. So that meant every one of them had to be caught. 
times, and we're talking of thousands uh, nationwide, uh, just just everywhere. Uh, my father, when he joined the group, got sent up here to Bennington County, and his first job was to start with uh, TB and gluten blood testing. Uh, all the cows in Bennington County. Uh, The, uh, the, the, uh, the, he, he, uh, he started, he, he had to go to every single farm, and there were a lot of farms and wooden stanchions. Things were kind of primitive. It was a little bit hard to kind of hold the animals. Uh, one of the things that you would have to do uh, for the big animals, uh, uh, here, uh, they would go through and catch every large bovine and put nose pinchers in the nose and pull the head off to the side and go into the jugular vein and get a blood sample. Uh, now, now some of the dairy cows that were handled all the time were were, were pretty easy to handle. They were in stanchions. A lot of times you could just put a halter on and, and pull their head off to the side. They weren't. But the younger animals were not handled every day. So animals that were, oh, six months old were pretty big. And it, routinely at that time, they were all in pens. So you would have six or eight large cows, young cows, moving around. And uh, you had to grab their heads, pull them to the side, get them in a stanchion, halter them, test them. The TB testing was that you took a little bit of tuberculin and injected it in the skin fold underneath the tail and just on the side of the vulva. Now, some cows did not really appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, your you're on the back end. <laughs> so, needless to say, uh, sometimes my father said he'd come home and pour his feet out of his boobs. Uh, so, so you would get stepped on and, and pushed and everything with these bigger, bigger heifers. Uh, the dairy cows were easier uh, because they were handled twice a day and you could work around the back of them and around the front of them. So, so that was that was much easier. So, so Dad started doing this. Uh, he, he, it was not always uh, acceptable for the veterinarian to come on the farm and do this testing. Word soon spread that in some, so, and in some cases. The, every single animal on the farm, uh, especially milking, would test positive. And the, all the reactors, as we call them, that tested positive had to be destroyed. You couldn't sell them, you couldn't use the meat, they had to be destroyed. So, needless to say, it was a kind of an apprehensive day for the farmer when he got the notice that we would be coming to TV, or when Dad would be coming to TV and blood test, uh, they were never, we were always wondering what was going to happen. And there were, were some people that really didn't want it done at all. And he went on one farm, and the, the uh, farmer met him at the door, and he said, you're not TB and blood testing my cows. And he said, I'm going to the house and I'm going to get a shotgun for you. <laughs> and if you are still here, I'm going to shoot you. <laughs> so, so dad uh, left. <laughs> and uh, he sent that card back to the state. Well, a few days later, the Vermont state police and the state veterinarian came in and those those cows were tested. So that word also spread that 
your animals are going to be tested one way or the other. Uh, I didn't mention, not just to mention, because uh, this was another another example of uh, what we what he would run up against. Uh, he was a large person, and he uh, wanted to go out for football, and got he had to he worked because it was in the depression. He was working for the the city around the reservoir near there, and he, he didn't go back the three weeks early that was required to go to football. So when he went in, he asked to go to play football. Uh, he saw this whole line of people that he was going to have to work against to get on the team. So he, he put the, took that equipment back and said, I want to wrestle. So long story short, he wrestled the four years and was heavyweight wrestling champ at Ohio State University. <laughs> now, I mention this because in, in down in Pono, he walked into uh, a farm and got into the milking, milk house, and uh, he, he uh, the farmer was a very big fella, met him, and said, you're not testing my cows and I'm throwing you off the property. So he reached to grab that to throw him physically off the property and and he related this to me oh years later he said i reached to grab your father and the next thing i found myself flat on the milk house floor in a puddle of water with a big fist about this far away from my face <laughs> and he said i let him TV tv test my bird <laughs> He, uh, the word got around that it was going to have to be done. And it, it was hard for a lot of farmers. They lost a lot of cattle. Uh, sometimes it was only maybe, a lot, of, a lot of farms at this time were probably oh, 15 or 20 cows. They weren't like when you go up through the Meadowee Valley and see that back then they were probably 60 cows. Uh, so a lot of small farms, there's a couple over on the uh, West Road, uh, you can see the barns now, and uh, they, they only had like 10 to 15 cows. Uh, so it, it was uh, a, it, it kind of, it was a, a lot, dad would leave early, it was a lot of labor, and uh, so you'd have to get from farm to farm, ha get help, and get all of them done. And 72 hours later, you had to read all the TB tests. The, the, the blood test for the brucellosis was taken from the neck and every night we put those on the bus and sent them up to Burlington uh, to the lab up there to be tested. But slowly uh, you know, all the program worked and eradication uh, you know, did, did occur. But it was, uh, I came back to work in 1962 and we were still TB and blood testing uh, all the cows. It was all required. Uh, and and um, so I, uh, but I seldom got any reactors. Occasionally there would be one, but it was very seldom. Uh, but when you went to test every herd, uh, some of them were, were not the easiest. And <laughs> one that I had was, excuse me, a herd of Angus. And I, I don't know if you folks are, are familiar with the different breeds, but Angus and the dairy cows and the Herefords are usually pretty nice animals to work with. But I never ever enjoyed working with a single uh, Angus that I remember. And I would say that you'd almost as soon work on a buffalo <laughs> as, as, as on a Angus. And, and we had this one herd that was all Angus. And they were just outside all the time, what day and night, winter, summer. Uh, and, and so nobody handled them. And so I, I got the card from the state telling me I had to go 
you know, test is heard, oh man, I thought, oh, this is going to be terrible. I, I don't know if I come back without a broken leg, I'm going to be lucky. So for three or four days, I was, I was dreading this call. And most calls, I didn't dread. But this one, I got to say, I really dreaded. But to my amazement and uh, uh, good feeling, I got to the farm and they had all the cows, they had gotten all the cows in the barn and in the stanchion. Wow. And the farmer had taken the barn door off where you walk, where, where all the cows would go in, a big rope door that you would roll back and forth, big heavy door. And he took that off and he took it over and he had a handle on each end and two of the men uh, <laughs> set it in the gutter behind the cows. If you are familiar with barns and, and gutters and all that are behind there are a nice little uh, uh, area that you could set the, the barn door in and they started sliding it right down behind <laughs> it, and it was bam, 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 bam all the way down. Those cows, every time I got to the cow to reach for its tail head to TV test it, it would kick and slam that door. I felt so good. Let me see. Quick uh, question. Yeah, sure, anytime. Were those tests accurate? Yes, yes. It's, it's very similar to what you get for a TV test today to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you use the tuberculin, you put it sub Q, in, in, in under, just barely in the skin, un, or slightly under it maybe, and uh, in 72 hours, we'd get a reaction if it was positive. Which meant that you had to go back to the farm and eradicate any we, animals? Or no? The state did that. Oh. The, the state came down, every animal that was positive, the state came down with uh, a, a truck to load the cows on and, and would take them. We didn't have anything to do with that. Yeah. What year were you doing that? Well, my father started this in 19, let's see, probably, he probably came up here about 1934. Right. And then they, they decided in that period of time that they liked Manchester. And so they bought in 1935, they bought the place that we're at now, a few people know where that is. And it was a small farm, there's about 40 acres behind it, and they had, we, we had stanchions in the milking parlor, milking barn, and it was, uh, uh, I think it was probably 12, 10 or 12 stanchions, so it's a really small farm, but you know, that's what a lot of people were doing, that where we live right now, uh, they also would milk cows, uh, and they'd only tie up two cows. They were just like family cows, and they milk them twice a day for the milk. And uh, but they did have a, a hay mow, and they used horses. Uh, mostly horses were used initially. Uh, let me see. Uh, we. Um, While uh, Dad was going to these farms, uh, he was uh, you know, had a pretty full full cage, full cage every day, a load of the animals to test. Uh, but while he was there, a farmer would say, "Oh, uh, this this cow's been lame, or this this cow's not eating, uh, or uh, my horse is sore. There's something wrong with him." And uh, they'd say, "Will you look at it?" <laughs> well. Uh, he finally called the state veterinarian and said, people are asking me to look at these sick animals and uh, would, can, is it okay if I do that? And he said, I don't care what you do on your time as long as you get all the tests that we've sent to you done. <laughs> and so he started working on uh, animals that, that were sick. Uh, well, word started to spread that he was looking at sick animals and before too long uh, he couldn't look at all the animals that were sick and uh, um, uh, get all his testing done. Right. 
Uh, so he called the state, but that's when he decided to go into private practice and stay where he is right now, or where, where we are right now. Uh, he, uh, he sent all, he told them he wanted to resign, and, but they said, okay, well, we'd like to have you test every, every cow in your area. And our area pretty much covered from Rupert at the state line, up through uh, Pollitt, over to Danby, over to Weston, uh, down past Jamaica, back to Manchester, East Dorset, down to Arlington, and over to Sandgate. And it was over in Sandgate where the fella said he was going to shoot him. <laughs> earlier. Yeah, right. yeah, earlier. That, <laughs> but that farm went out of business. So of course we didn't have to go back there. Uh, so uh, he, he started uh, practicing and on just the practice, not working for the state, and people started coming in with some small animals. And this was very occasional. Uh, as a matter of fact, first of all, uh, the, a lot of the farmers, and they weren't, most of the people were farming, and they were kind of marginal farms, a lot of them. And, and uh, one fella went to give an idea of, of what it was like for, for, to treat an animal, uh, he brought a cat in that was very sick, and he wanted Dad to look at it, and he wanted to know how much it would cost, and Dad looked it over and told him what he had to do and what he thought it would cost, and he said, oh, I can take care of that for 25 cents. And so I knew he was going to take the cat out and shoot it. <laughs> so, so there wasn't a lot of treatment <laughs> initially. But uh, people, you know, that, well, people that had, for example, good cow dogs, or, or really got pet uh, cats, you know, whatever. Cats were not very, very popular, uh, they, unless they were barn cats, and they were used to catch mice and rats, <laughs> and and those kind of had to make it on their own. They, they were very seldom treated, unless unless they were really good, like what the farmers would call catters. If they were really good uh, mousers and, and all, then they might, might treat them if it wasn't too bad. So initially, small animal practice was really limited. Uh, uh, as, uh, as it started, uh, we, well, what happened, I'll back up a little bit here. In, I think it was the early 60s, Eisenhower decided to improve the roads and, and put in a road system. And, and so I think they were four lane highways coming out of uh, New York and Boston and then up to, up to Vermont even. And, and at that same time, at the end of World War II, uh, fellas that had been in the service and were in the ski troopers got out of the service and saw that there was an opportunity to build uh, ski areas. Mm -hmm. And so soon after that, uh, the, they Bromley, uh, Fred Papp started Bromley, uh, probably the first one there was Snow Valley, and then Stratton was developed, uh, Magic Mountain. So we started to get a lot more tourists. Now, initially when the tourists came up, if they brought a pet, it was up and they just leave it for the weekend. So, so we started to do a little bit of boarding and, <laughs> and we put in cages. Uh, we, we, the hospital where it is now initially was quite a large uh, hen house. <laughs> so, so we took the front end of the front side and we made a area for a waiting room uh, area to uh, put in cages to hold and hold pets, and then at the far end was a room for examining animals. And then later on, it, it started to develop into an area to do surgery. Um, that that 
was okay to start with, but very soon we outgrew that. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, so we had the, uh, the, the small animal park, and we started taking, uh, well, initially when fellows would, farmers would come in with an animal, they'd come into the kitchen. My mother didn't care for that, uh, especially if it was right at supper time, which was most of the time after they finished their chores, they would bring a, a sick animal in, and dad would look at it in the house. Uh, this was a relatively short period of time. <laughs> so, so that's when we, he, they remodeled the first part and put in exam room and a treatment area. Then. While people came up to Steve, they wanted to bring their pets, so, so they started asking if they could leave them in our cages. And uh, initially, the, the cages were just for an animal that was following treatment, that we wanted to see it and not and watch it for the next day or overnight or something. But we had enough extra cages that we could, then any of the ones that we had were mostly trauma cases, not something that was infectious. So it was okay to board, uh, good pets, you know, healthy pets. So we do that for a weekend and uh, while people were skiing. But with the, the other thing that occurred about this time was uh, the state said that farmers could no longer ship milk in cans. They, uh, that, up, up until that point, Oh, they had, we had started to get milking machines so that people weren't milking just by hand anymore. Uh, and they would take and take the milk, put it in a, a filter, uh, uh, I guess you, yeah, there was a, a big container with a filter in the bottom. They dump, they filter the milk into the cans and those would be put in, uh, in, in water, cold water and they would be picked up every day. Uh, well, at that point, the, the state said you could no longer ship milk out of uh, uh, milk cans that had to be in bulk tanks. Well, the bulk tanks were kind of expensive. Even back at that time, uh, they were what I thought was expensive. And I mean, maybe close to $5,000. Now, this was more than a small farm with just a few cows really didn't need that and, and really couldn't afford it. So the older farmers that weren't going to add more animals decided to retire. Younger people coming in couldn't afford to buy farms and buy a bulk tank and start milking and increasing the size of the herd. That, so what happened was a lot of land opened up, uh, especially around Manchester and up on the mountain. Uh, one thing I didn't, didn't mention, I, I guess, was uh, the mountain, before Eisenhower put in the uh, uh, new road system and we started paving our roads in Manchester, I only knew of two uh, paved roads, one out here in the middle of Dorset and one in Manchester, in the middle of Manchester. And everything else was dirt. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we, I remember riding up the Meadowee Valley behind another car and the dust was just rolling up behind us, behind it. We didn't dare get into the, the, the dust at all because there might be an animal or a car that was broken or something. So you had to wait far enough behind the <coughs> excuse me, car for the dust to settle so that you could travel up. So, so that could be kind of rough. And the other part of that was in the middle of summer, when you had all that dust, you couldn't roll your windows down because the dust would pour in. But we didn't have air conditioning no. at that time. So, so you'd roll it up, roll it down for a few minutes, roll it right back up. And, and try to get up to Pollard or Danby or wherever you're going on one of those roads. Um, the other thing that we didn't know, the road, the old road, in, in, where if you leave Manchester and go up past uh, Bob's Diner and up past the, uh, where the, where the uh, forestry service is, 
uh, as you go across that flat, there's a road off to the left, and it's just got private houses on it now. But it used to go out to toll gate, and that literally was a toll gate. There was a big arm there, and it would come down, you'd pay your fee, it would go up, and the road then went in underneath what is now the bridge, uh, crossing over that brook. You'd go along the brook and up to the base of a steep hill by Snow Valley. And then you would turn, either turn left and go up around where people park now to go on the long trail. And you'd go out to Kandahar or is it the Pinnacle? Uh, whatever, what, yeah, I think that's what that's called now. You'd go up that way, or you'd go, if you wanted to go over to Bonville or down to uh, Jamaica somewhere, you'd go up over the hill by Snow Valley. And that in the winter time and in the spring was if you could make it. <laughs> now, in, in the winter time, I mean, that was really steep. And that, that where, you, where the road turned the split and went up, uh, there was a big sign there that told how to get to uh, all, the, all the towns, Peru, London area, that way, or the other way, Bonville, and so forth. And, uh, and that, everybody called that a guide board. So the hill by Brom or Snow Valley was called Guideboard Hill. And, uh, uh, and I remember as a, you know, I used to ride with my father. I even started riding. Uh, when I took my blanket and put it on the front seat of the car, and I, I had my bottle, so I brought most of the day with him. So I, I, I always, I had always been with him quite a bit. And going up over Guyboard Hill, we never knew if we we're going to make it, and we didn't. At that point, uh, you, you just uh, have. There weren't at that point. There were any farm uh, phones in the farms, farms or anything. <laughs> So if we got stuck, then we had to get out. Sometimes we'd have to get a team of horses to come down if it was muddy and, and pull us out. Otherwise, if it was wintertime and icy, you have to put chains on. And oh, that was a terrible job. <laughs> Those metal chains would get so cold. Your fingers would be so cold. Uh, I hated that job. And, but pretty quick, you know, everything was paid. Uh, Probably somebody here remembers, uh, I think it was in the early, early uh, 70s maybe that they started the road over the mountain as it is now. Uh, and I remember you know, going out the old way and as, I, as we went around the little pond where you go to the pinnacle, they would be burning the, the road, the trail, the trees on the road. So. Uh, it was about that time that they started getting improved roads here in Vermont. Uh, they started getting them all paved, uh, so that was that was a relief to see all that. Uh, let me see. Uh, when when uh, like when Dad started, a good share of the practice was uh, logging horses and uh, dairy cattle, and uh, it, it seemed like we always got uh, calls to go on log jobs. And I didn't mind that because I like to ride out. I like to see the horses. I like to see how they were stanching, uh, stalled, uh, a lot of different ways. But uh, the farmer, or the loggers, did not like a youngster around. So quite often, they would take me over to the cook shack and make me stay there until Dad got finished treating the horse. I didn't mind that because Cookie usually gave me something to eat, and so I, I could stand that. Um, uh, Dad, we, we were out one time in a, on a farm, and I was riding with him, and uh, Dad was talking with one of the farmers, and he said to the farmer, he said, you know, I don't know why I uh, always get called out on log jobs at night. And the fellow said, you really don't know? And he said, no, no, I don't know. And he said, because you charge the same amount, whether it's day or night, and they want to get a full day's work in, and then they call you. <laughs> so 
So we changed that, and all our <laughs> horse, calls, <laughs> horse calls started coming in during the day. Uh, um, one of our friends uh, uh, started up in northern Maine, right on the border, uh, up, going into Canada. And his very first call was a call to go uh, on a sick horse out on a log job. And he drove up to the road, the log road, and got onto the sleigh. And there, it was at night, of course. He was getting the same things as the work, you know, calling at night. He hadn't started emergency calls yet. And on the post, on either side of the sleigh, were lanterns. And they were swinging back and forth. And the pair of horses were in front. And uh, so he, he looked out and he saw this animal trotting down the log road right next to and in front of the pair of horses. So they were there and he was here and just keeping right up and just walking right along. And he looked at it and it was kind of dark. He couldn't really be sure. So he, he looked at the logger and he said, I didn't know you folks used mules up here in Maine. And the logger looked at him, and he said, that's a moose, you damn fool. <laughs> <laughs> that was a moose walking down the road. He never dreamed that would happen. And, and uh, he said, for the next two or three years, every log job I went on, they asked me if I was a veterinarian that couldn't tell a moose. <laughs> so so he, that was a good beginning for him. Uh, <laughs> oh, let me see here. What, uh, uh, one of the things early on, and even even now, uh, is restraint. And uh, restraint to begin with was mostly all mechanical. We had nose pictures, and you would grab the cow's head. Uh, put the nose pinchers in the nose and tie the head around so that you could could handle it. Either either if you were working on it because the cow had mastitis in the back or a sore foot or you, you know either way you tried to restrain the cow. When the head was pulled off one side or the other, it really didn't try to fight too much. So so that was that was fine. We didn't uh, and even 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 later on when we got a lot of chemical restraint. We kept using these because if uh, if you used a chemical restraint, uh, that would get in the milk and the uh, farmer would have to throw the milk away. And so we didn't use much of any chemical restraint any of the time, so we were using most all physical. Uh, about this time, as I had mentioned earlier, people were coming in and leaving their animals, and we built our small animal hospital. Uh, we had, we had enough for about, uh, I think, 30 animals. But one client had 20 cats and five dogs. And, and they would come up and leave them for the weekend. And if they were going on a, a large, long trip, it might even leave them for a week or more. Uh, but uh, handling the horses, uh, we had, uh, it was, uh, we had, this is a twitch. Have you have a, are you all familiar, familiar with a twitch? No. You put this on the nose and you start to tighten it up. And you can get it up good and tight, and that takes the horse's attention <laughs> away from what you're going to be doing. So, uh, we, you know, we would use these a lot. You had the chain twitch, and you had the rope twitch. So, uh, the rope twitch, you just use on, on pretty placid animals just to get their attention. But, you know, if you're, if you're looking at a, an abscess foot uh, and you hit the abscess, all of a sudden they're not so tame anymore. And, and so you got to be sure that you're taking their attention up there or you can get pretty badly hurt. Uh, one of the things uh, with horses as we did, uh, their, their teeth grow out. Normally, chewing, the teeth uh, are, are worn down, but every now and then, some of them get long. 
And so it's quite often in the spring uh, before they went out to fields, we would have to look at horses uh, that were not eating their food very good and their teeth were long and you'd have to file them down. So, <laughs> so you, you'd call, uh, it was called floating and don't ask me why, but if you're gonna float the horse's teeth, that's what you were gonna do. So this is one of the things. Uh, small animal we had, uh, also you get, uh, we put a, a sick cat or something, uh, a dog in a cage. This would be for a cat. Uh, we had to get them out. And if they got back in the corner and they were just all eyes or all teeth and, and nails, you didn't want to reach in and grab them when they're sick. So we would take and put this around their neck, pull them out from the back of the cage where they were hunkered down, and then take them by the scruff of the neck. Now if you take the loose skin on the back of a cat and put it up tight and pull their head back, that it really kind of restrains them. Once you do that for their head back, they kind of don't want to do anything. I'll say kind of, because uh, <laughs> you want to be careful, because it's not always that. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, with dogs, that didn't, we could get them out. Usually, they would come out to begin with, and we put a, just a little noose or a leash on them. But then when we we're going to handle them, I didn't bring them, we put a muzzle on. And uh, we have leather muzzles that we could put on that would come right up to their eyes. You could take uh, gauze, uh, roll it so it's good and tight, make a noose and put that over their mouth and pull it up tight and usually put, tie that in a bow knot. So if something happened, you could reach up and loosen it quickly. Uh, so that was you know, some of the forms of restraint that we had to use commonly. And, and I wouldn't say every day, but, you know, I'd say two or three times a week at least. And, and so when animals also are sick or hurting, if they had an abscess or something was really sore, then you really had to do something like that. Uh, we, as the, uh, as, as, with the road system and the, and the inventory of land that opened up, uh, people that wanted to ski came up and they wanted to stay. They were coming up, some of them you know, would come up and stay for their vacation for a week. Uh, and so, so with that, uh, they brought their animals up and we started getting a lot more animals, uh, small animals and, and sick animals. And uh, they had uh, uh, re remodeled the old uh, uh, what was the old chicken house, and put in a bank of cages. But then we put in a surgery and uh, exam room. Uh, now we have three exam rooms and a surgery. So we've enlarged it quite a bit over the years. They're thinking of putting another one in. And I was talking about the one I was in there this morning. Uh, so so uh, the the we came they brought in more animals and and more and more farms were going out uh, after that you know the sale they just uh, just you didn't have nearly the farm calls um, you'd have a few maybe big farms uh, farm, call, farm calls but uh, uh, not very much uh, it, it, well let me see uh, It, with the increase in, in uh, small animals and the, the different sicknesses, uh, they required more care. Uh, and I realized this when a, a lady came in with her little dog with terrible teeth. Uh, when it set it on the table, you could smell the breath. And, I tried to look at the tooth, I wanted to bring up the lid, and it wanted to bite right away. So I, I did uh, 
sort of anesthetized it, just kind of tranquilized it. And then I was able to look at the teeth and pick up the lip. And it was just covered with tartar. All the teeth, big ones, you cut tartar. You'd have to chip it off. And so uh, I, I told her, well, you know, we're going to have to put this dog on anesthesia, uh, on, on antibiotics for uh, uh, maybe a week before we do any surgery and try to get rid of this infection. And then we'll have to scrape the teeth and, uh, you know, probably remove a few that look kind of loose. And she said, oh, no, no, I don't want any teeth removed. And I, I said, well, probably your best bet is to go down to Connecticut to a veterinarian down there that's just doing dentistry. So I referred her down to Connecticut, and I didn't hear anything more. And I was in the grocery store six months later, and I saw her. And I said to her, well, how did your, how did your dog's teeth come out? And she said, oh, it was fantastic. I'm so glad you referred me down there. She said, I had to go back three times, and it was only $2,500 each time. <laughs> so <laughs> I started to realize then that probably we could put in more equipment and, <laughs> and, and, and charge a little more for services that were getting done maybe in the city or something. And with that, uh, we, we put in x-ray machines. The first x-ray machines were really uh, uh, primitive. But now, I mean, they, you don't even, this is a, this here is, a, I'll just tell you this. When we got into vet school, one of our first courses was radiology. And we walked in and sat down, and the professor said, these are radiographs, not x-rays. He said, x-rays are electromagnetic uh, waves and he said, if you put your hands in there, you're going to get burned. He said, this is a radiograph. So for the rest of the semester, everything was a radiograph. Uh, but I use this, but if I were to take this out in the exam room today, it would be called an x-ray, and I'd be looking at the animal's uh, condition uh, at an x-ray. <laughs> so, but for that semester, they were radiographs. <laughs> uh, what else might I touch on here? Uh, I, said, I said, if you handle x-rays, they're going to burn you. And, uh, and he was right. There were a lot of veterinarians uh, that I remember as a youngster. They, they would try to x-ray animals, restraining them with bare hands. And their fingernails were all deformed. They were just, some of them had no fingernails, uh, but the, the gross plates uh, at the base of the toenails were all destroyed. And uh, of course, and they got malformed. It was bad. Uh, We, uh, extra, uh, the machines that we get now are, are amazing. Uh, I gotta say, we got a, we got a new, after I retired, uh, Rob had put in another, another new machine, and now you don't take, uh, you don't get, get films. They're, they're just electronically stored, and they're, uh, you take, uh, you can take and just show it on a screen, uh, without ever handling them. And so, uh, uh, I was, this was all new to me, and I was in the hospital for, uh, on a, for a Saturday, and this first person brought in a cat, and it was just laying out flat. Nothing, wouldn't have, I thought probably it wasn't going to make it. I, I put it on fluids, uh, gave it a little bit of stimulants, and uh, I, I said, let's take an x-ray and see, radiograph, sorry. So, so, uh, so I told him, let's take an x-ray, and we'll, so I, I think it's probably heart trouble, but I don't know, it might be lungs. And so uh, we took the x-ray, and that was so, chest was so full of fluid that uh, I, I, 
couldn't really see anything. But at the time, and now, the, all of the radiologists in the veterinary schools uh, got together and formed a group that would take take uh, x-ray cases from from us throughout the nation. So we were we joined them, and so I called and I got one of the veterinarians and told him what it, what we had, gave him all the descriptions, and t showed him and sent the x-ray out. I didn't do it. I had the technicians do it because they were new and I did not know what I was doing as far as handling that machine and all. So anyway, I sent uh, we sent the x-rays out uh, and and I uh, he called back and said, oh, he said it's just a blurogram. I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> but, but he said, I think it's heart. So give him this medicine and let's see what it's like in the morning. So sure enough, I gave the medicine and the next morning the cat was up purring, moving around. So I took another another x-ray and uh, I called him, told him I was going to send it out. And uh, so, so all you have to do is just uh, electronically send it out to me. Uh, and, and so I called him and, and I had my cell phone. So I was calling him on my cell phone and I got him on his cell phone. And I, I said, well, just for the fun of it, where are you? And he said, well, right at this moment, I'm just outside of Columbus, Ohio. I'm going to pick up my son from soccer and I'll go back home and I have uh, in my den, I can read this this uh, x-ray radiograph for you. And he said, we'll see what we got. So he I'm walking around in the hospital, not tied to a landline and doing all the stuff that I wanted to get done and it rang. And he said, yeah, he said, bingo, we got it. He said it is heart, and he described what the heart condition was and, and what we should do. So was, even then, I was pretty amazed that I could walk around the hospital with my cell phone mm -hmm. and be in different places and, and get a call from him in Columbus, Ohio, uh, Sunday morning, uh, with what was wrong. Uh, it, when, when I came back, when I came back, uh, Dad had been working, and so basically it was a, a one-man practice, and this was in 1962. And I figured what I'd do, I had gotten uh, a deferment to go to undergraduate school, a deferment to go to veterinary school, and a deferment to go, I worked at Angel Memorial and Rowley Memorial in Boston and uh, Springfield. To get some experience, I first thought I'd work in the large animal clinic, and I got a job there, and Dad said, well, you know, things are changing so much, we're not going to have many horses and cows. He said, I think you should do more with small animals. So <laughs> I didn't want to do this, because the professor, I'd gone in, talked with him at the head of the large animal clinic, and he was kind of an older veterinarian and kind of gruff. And, and most of the people really didn't want to go work with him too much because he was so kind of gruff. I really didn't want to go in and tell him I wasn't going to take his job, but, but I had to do it. So anyway, so I went out there and we worked for, for a year and a half and uh, got experience out there. And so uh, 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 when we got back, and I, Dad, Dad, very soon after we got back, Dad had a stroke. And so it, it pulled me out of the draft. The draft board called and said, uh, you've got too many things to do here. He said, uh, you, you're, you're essential. You're going to have to stay in the area and, and not go in the service. So I never did go in the service. Uh, Dad had his stroke. He, he came out of it, really came out of it remarkably well. And uh, so then we didn't have enough business to support two people. So we took uh, the uh, head of the racing commission. They started racing down in Powell, horse racing. And he knew we did large animal. And he came down and talked to us. And he said, what I'd like is I'd like a practice like yours where there's two people so that I know somebody's always going to be there. Uh, said if I got just one person um, 
you you know if you get a, an emergency you can't go to the track and he said i don't want that <coughs> and the next thing he said was uh that you're far enough away so that you're not going to have any clients down there and he said i don't want you in in the well it was a, i'll call it the post race receiving area after the after the race uh somebody had to go we had uh, um technicians that I think we had about 15, and they'd have eight races, and each one was assigned a race, and when the race went off, that technician would go over and grab the horse that won, and bring it back to the post-race receiving area. We had to uh, take a, a saliva sample and a, uh, a urine sample, so because we had to take a saliva sample, when you got down there, it was the spit box. We didn't work in the post race receiving area at all. We worked in the spit box. So we would have to collect all sorts of, uh, all sorts of horses. Normally you'd walk them, they'd come in and they'd be thirsty. We could, we could, as soon as they came in, we got their saliva sample. We had uh, sterile forceps, uh, that we, we autoclaved through the evening, and we had sterile gauzes and a little little uh, saline. So it was sort of wet. We put it in their mouth. Most of the time, they really liked it because they were racing and they their mouth was dry, so they would chew it. But uh, some of them uh, didn't. And, and one horse was an excellent athlete, and we knew if he came in, he was going to win. So. Uh, we always dreaded it, and uh, yeah, I always dreaded it. So this one night, this horse came in, and a cowboy was bringing him in. A cowboy from uh, Colorado was bringing him in, and uh, so the cowboy came in, and I said, "Well, you know, this horse is probably going to go up on us, so just be aware of it." And he said, "Yeah, okay." And he, upset. And he, he took the lead shank and held on to it. I grabbed the halter, started to put it in the horse's mouth, and the horse reared up and started striking. So, uh, you know, he handled the lead shank foot, brought the horse down, and he said, well, he said, I'll fix that. So he said, he reached up and he grabbed the horse's ear with two hands, twisted it, and put his forearms against the head and held it just like this. And he said, go ahead. So I took the, the uh, specimen and, and put it back in the horse's mouth, or tried to, and he went up again. And, and he said, okay. He said, that's it. And he took that horse and he pulled the ear down and he bit on it. <laughs> and he was biting hard. I expected to see blood. And I thought, I thought, oh man, this cowboy's going to lose every tooth in his head. And and the horse <laughs> just stood there. And, and it was just kind of shaking. And I got the easiest saliva sample I ever got. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so he knew he knew how to restrain animals. That was for sure. Uh, well. Uh, I guess we're supposed to go to one, were we? Yeah, about nine. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll just say, uh, I know probably folks have other things to do, too. Uh, uh, so we, we went, we worked at the racetrack, and after that, uh, uh, I'd gotten his coat. It was easy for him to go down and do that work and, uh, and not have to be out working on farms and all. So, Basically, I did that. I occasionally go down if they wanted to do something. Uh, we, we, uh, as our practice uh, grew, uh, I, I couldn't handle it. Uh, we started another office over in London, Gary, and uh, so uh, we we would hire <coughs> fellows that just got out of school uh, and were looking for jobs to see if they would come and work for one or two years, and in some cases just stay right on. But we, you know, so we had this one uh, 
inter, uh, you know, just fresh graduate that came out and had started working for us and was doing a nice job. He, he, he was uh, very capable and, and uh, I was very impressed with him. I'll back up just a little bit. As, as our kids were growing up, we, we raised cattle and heifers and uh, to get them so they could you know, go to school. A lot of the farmers would, would take their cows and maybe they were gonna raise six, six replacements. So they, would, they wanted them all about the same size because they didn't want uh, six, eight months old in with uh, a month old or two months. And so then they, if they did that, that was a lot of extra work to tie up uh, any, any calves once they got uh, the, the required replacements that they needed. So uh, he, uh, uh, this fella, had, uh, 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 so uh, my point was that we had started raising calves and, and when a farmer had a really good registered cow uh, and a calf, if it, unless he registered and kind of advertised it, uh, it was gonna go over to, to the meat market or over to, to just get, you know, as a great cow. It wouldn't go as a registered calf. Richard calf didn't bring any more money uh, than a regular one, and that was, you know, not very much at all. So our kids had started raising calves, and as I went on farms, I could see these heifers or cows that were going to good cows that were going to be uh, calving, and so I would buy oh probably four or five of these calves throughout the year, and our boys would raise them and. A couple of the boys uh, had their own, we had a cow and they milked it. So they were over there morning and night and they seemed to enjoy it. But they had this one, this, uh, they got to handle uh, uh, the animals and, and know what was going on. And uh, so uh, they would ride with me. Well, this one night, uh, this, this one uh, new fella had, had gone up the Danby to look at a cow that was off. And he called back from the farm and said it was a, a cow that uh, was ready to calve, but the uterus was twisted, and it was twisted 180 degrees. So instead of the feet being down, the feet were up. Well, those can be, especially if they're younger animals, I didn't know what it was, if it was a heifer, there's not a lot of room there. And so it, it requires, you know, a, a little, uh, probably should have taken a, you, a little experience is what I should say. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew he hadn't had any. Well, Sally and I and the kids were all going on a week's vacation. And so I said to them, well, let's, let's go up to Danby uh, <laughs> and just check, check and be sure that Terry is, is, is okay. So we all come into the barn and there's Tom about, oh, I'd say six or seven years old. And we're watching and, and Terry's trying to open it up and, and the, the birth canal was still kind of small and, and he, he, he got it dilated so he's doing fine. And, and he said, well, I'll try, to, I'll try to rotate it. Well, when he did, the water broke. And, and just before that, uh, Tom was standing there and he said, Terry, you better button your boots. And we all wore clinic boots that came up to just below our knee and you could latch them. Mm. Well, Terry had put them on, but they're wide open. And, <laughs> And so <laughs> Tom said, Terry, you better button your boots. And just as he said that, the water broke and filled his boots. <laughs> and so, so uh, I thought, oh man, this, is, this isn't good. And uh, so anyway, Terry went in and he said, I think I can rotate it okay. He said, it's moving. He said, I'll keep, I'll keep trying to rotate it. And he was doing it barehanded. About that time, Tom says, Terry, you better put on your gloves. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said to Sally, I think, I think Terry's had enough <laughs> from, from Tom. <laughs> I think we better leave. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, 
the kids grew, grew up and went on to school. Uh, I, uh, I didn't really care for coursework because, uh, in just one example, I, I had a big day uh, of outside calls, and the uh, I, uh, I went out to look at this one horse that this uh, uh, young young high school girl uh, had had wanted me to look at. So I went out to get it, and uh, 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 she was she had, she wasn't there. And her father said, well, she hasn't come back from school yet. Uh, the horse is out in the field if you want to go get it. And I said, well, I, I don't think I want to do that. Uh, so I'll make another call. And I, I tried to work the day's worth around it. So, so I uh, called. We set up another time. And uh, the horse had a bad uh, right hind leg. And so I put the, uh, she had the halter on. I put a lead shank on. And... Uh, and I said, okay, now you hold, you stay on the right side and hold the head good and tight. And then if there, if there's anything, any comes up, just take and pull the head towards you and put your shoulder into the horse's shoulder and just move around. And uh, so, I, uh, uh, so I, I gave her that information. Then I went down to pick up the horse's foot. And I started trying to peel it out. I had it in between my legs, uh, trying to peel it out, and I hit an abscess. And that horse kicked, and I went rolling out into the field. And I looked after I got up, and the, the girl was way out there. She had dropped the lead chain, was standing in the field with nobody controlling the horse. So uh, this was things that we would commonly get into uh, with, with people that hadn't really, you know, known restraint or stuff like that. So I, uh, I wasn't really fond of horse work. When, when I went down to the track, we didn't, do, we didn't do any horse work down there. There were a couple of stables, and those people, I enjoyed working with horses there, but the field horses that we got up here, I didn't, I didn't really care for. <laughs> uh, well... I guess uh, I guess that's basically what I was going to talk about. Uh, the we would have to use we got so you know we have to do uh, anesthesia. Anesthesia in small animals could be well in in any animal could be injectable, but if you inject it, they could be sensitive to it. So you never really knew how much to give. You'd give it very slowly and watch the reaction. And there were stages that the animal would go through. So you'd look for those stages and you'd have to see how quickly you went through it. Some of them were very sensitive. And if you put it in too fast, they, they'd probably expire. So uh, uh, injectable anesthesia was kind of dangerous. And this one girl in Manchester had a horse that she wanted to have castrated. And uh, so I, I said, all right, I will, I'll help you do that. I'll, I'll do, come out and do it. And uh, dad had just gotten through his stroke and it was a first, it was a beautiful day. And so he said, well, why don't you come out? You know, and we brought a lawn chair and set the chair up right ne next to the car and said, you could, I said, you could get, just uh, get out and enjoy seeing some what's going on and, and uh, the weather. And so I set the chair up and I, I used a, a new anesthetic and it was one that you popped in the neck, in the muscle. And so I gave the horse the required dose. And it waited a few minutes and pretty quick he got really sleepy and then he collapsed and he went down and I touched his eye and he was asleep. So I got out the equipment to go ahead and castrate him, and I had uh, uh, had the just the legs hold pulled back and tied just a little lightly, not not hard. And as I took the scalpel to cut through the skin, that horse came alive. <laughs> he rolled over, he kicked, and we had to get out of the way. He he got up. And he 
stumbled. He was really groggy. He stumbled and he went the 50 yards to where my father was and fell. Oh. He landed right on my father, knocked him out of the chair. Oh. I thought, oh, he's just recovering. Look at that. So I ran up and pulled him out from under the horse. And fortunately, he didn't go way over him, got on his legs mostly. And anyway, ultimately, we found that it broken his ankle. Oh. Oh my God. But I had to give the horse more anesthesia. I didn't know how much to give it, didn't want to kill it, but about that time I was kind of tired of moving with it. So, so I gave it more anesthesia and uh, finished the surgery. And then a few months later, in talking with the sales people that came around, they always told us kind of, you know, what's happened with other veterinarians around. They said, oh, the dose in this, when you get it, he said, you can't, uh, you can't depend on it, he said. Uh, some of them, some of them take twice what they're what they're saying on the bottle. So that was one of my experiences, <laughs> learning about different anesthetics, uh, injectable. I have a uh, question for you. Pardon? I have a question. Yes. What is this apparatus? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, mm -hmm. I did. Uh, <coughs> what uh, what we would do in, in small animals, uh, especially with cats, you could reach back in the cage. Mm -hmm and put this around their neck mm -hmm. and kind of get them out. Uh, if they're friendly, you don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But if they're really hurting and sick and they're a little mean, you're going to get clawed or bitten. And so we would just uh, put this on, go around their neck, bring them out. And then pretty much if you scruff the back of the neck and hold the head up, they're, they're sort of immobilized. We don't use this much anymore. We still use this. Now we use more a bag, mm. and we get them in the bag, and they they pretty much uh, give up once they're in the bag. Uh, <laughs> this, I mean, they can't they can't uh, get around and scratch, and mm -hmm. they kind of give up. And you can pull this up tight, so yeah. that uh, and you can move them around. You can move, you know, from a back ward into a front ward, or you can move them from mm -hmm. the treat from the treatment table onto the surgery table. <laughs> so. So that's what this is. We've got a few, All right. we've cool. got some others. Does everybody need that at home? Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, another practical question I have for you. Yep. <laughs> so you talked about these mouser no, yeah, they're mousers back in the day that people didn't have cats in the house, but they had mousers in the barn. In the barn, right? yep. Yeah. Okay. So now whatever, we are in a new era, cell phones, cats live at home mice still rain and i want to know if um what is the advice you know obviously i can call your off call your office i am definitely trying to get some free advice here at <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the <laughs> all right so um what do you think do you do you do you feed the house cat or do you starve the house cat? Or is there some sort of, I mean, how does, what's the, what is the, uh, what's the ratio of food versus starvation that a cat needs to be motivated? To, to be a mouser? To be a mouser. Yeah. yeah. Or what's, uh, how do you get a mouser? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, you know, some, some cats really apparently don't like mice. And, uh, you know, our cat, our cat, uh, you know, if a, if a mouse ran, I mean, it's prob it's probably the most placid cat that we had, and it was it was just, you know, quiet and, and easy to manage and pet and do anything, but if he saw a mouse or she saw a mouse run across, I mean, she was up and ready to go. So I think it's kind of an instinct, mm. and and some are a lot more aggressive than others. Okay. I think some are more lazy. Um, so. First, it's nothing to do with the kibble. No, I don't think so. Probably, prob, uh, I'll say this, that all the barn cats were, had a, always had a big pan of milk. Um, uh, and milk. At each milk, each milk tech milking, the farmer would dump it in and fill it, and the cats would come and drink. Mm. But So they would probably drink enough until they were full. Uh, nobody ever measured it. <laughs> but uh, they they would then be have to go gotcha. you know, hunt. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So I I think there's quite an instinct to whether they're gonna hunt or not. All right. 
Yeah. Did you bring copies of your book? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I've sold all my copies oh. to people oh, now, you. but uh, okay. I, uh, I don't think, I, I've got one that I kept, uh, that, uh, I, but I, I don't think I brought it because I kind of outlined what I wanted. Where, to can, we, where can we find the book? The book you can get them at uh, the Northshire bookstore, Shire? Northshire. Good. Yeah. I need to order more. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, just, I just went out to Cornell uh, to the vet school uh, earlier this month. Uh, for my, I hate to say it, my 60th reunion. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I saw a lot of classmates. I mean, some had come from Florida, some had come from California. So I was really glad I went out and had a good time. Uh, and and uh, one of my classmates uh, is uh, pretty famous. He, he started working in practice up in uh, Rutland for two years. Then he, did, he thought he'd go back to vet school. Ultimately, he went into virology and he found feline leukemia. And that was something that was killing a lot of cats. So with the, with the development of that, they were all developed a vaccine. So, so now, it's, it's, uh, his name is Fred Scott, and they have the Fred Scott Symposium every year, and it has to do with uh, medicine, you know, uh, what, what, what different things that have happened or are being developed yeah. in cats and different diseases. Yeah. And, and somebody had asked me a question, I realized that. I thought about this uh, going back, and I forgot to answer your question. I'm not sure what it was. Does anybody remember that I didn't answer it? Okay, good. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was just me. <laughs> so, uh, you answered all your cat questions. Right? Uh, I, got, I got a question. Yeah. Did Tom become a vet? No. <laughs> he, he's an IT person. Oh. Yeah. Uh, but Rob he's, did. Rob did. And, and and our daughter our daughter didn't want to work with animals that much, and she ended up going into uh, oh all of a sudden Sally and drawing a blank. No, oh, great. Well, it's not just me. Uh, Did she marry a vet? Pardon me? Did she marry a vet? No, no, no. no. But, pardon me? Yeah. She's a lab person. And, uh, but she, uh, oh gosh, work genetics. Uh, she, she went into genetics and is doing working in that field now. Tom, or Rob went into veterinary medicine. <laughs> Steve went into human medicine and is a cardiologist. Ooh, and, yeah. and he's out in uh, uh, Colorado. <laughs> and I, I'm just gonna mention this. Uh, I don't wanna get into any feelings of whatever people feel, but it, it hit me. And it hit me very strongly. We went in uh, to look at uh, a fetus, uh, a, 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 they took uh, an x-ray of a pregnancy. With that x-ray, you could look through the, the woman's body wall. You could look through the body wall of the fetus. You could look through the heart and see the valves beating. And you wow. could see, uh, you know, a, what might be wrong and what might not, that's what they're dealing with is, is problems and they're, they're trying to find out if there's a, a, some anatomical problem or something there. So anyway, it was so impressive for me with everything I've seen to see a fetus's heartbeat. And wow. uh, mm -hmm. so that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and anybody got any other questions? <laughs> Dr. Street, thank you very much. Right. Thank you again for coming out. Um, and if you do have more questions, um, Kathy brought some cookies. I think they're homemade chocolate chip. Yeah. And um, so you know they're going to be good. And um, so stick around and talk among yourselves and ask Dr. Street more questions. You might have it's raining if anyone's I was wondering about that. Yeah. Uh, 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 u